you guys have your Bibles with you? Oh, we always forget to bring our Bibles to church, to the Bible study. I know it's hard to remember. Okay. I think it's actually a good idea, maybe a good habit to start if we go to Bible study to bring our Bibles. It's kind of crazy. We're just waiting for the video so that these can be put online. Are people getting the emails to do the homework? For those of you who are not in a small group, you guys know that you can watch the videos online on our website. We also have the homework posted on our website. Um, our small group found this to be a very beneficial small group. Uh, if you guys have not had the chance to go deeper into it, there's still a chance you can go on our website. Hopefully all the information will be there. Um, we're actually very thankful that we got to do this series. Okay, let's just pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our dear Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself completely for us, we thank you, dear Lord, for calling us to this place, this place where you give yourself to us, where you reveal yourself to us, where you embrace us, where you, where you heal us, where you inspire us. I pray, dear Lord, that your words would, would come to us, dear Lord, in a form that we're able to take them and use them and apply them in our lives. We pray, dear Lord, that you would encourage us, that you would give us strength, that you would, dear Lord, that you would guide us and lead us to fight a good fight, to win this battle so that we can finally receive the crown which you've already fought for, that we would all be able to stand in glory on that final day. I pray, dear Lord, that you would give us courage, dear Lord. Help us, O Lord, to wage a good war, to bring down every stronghold that stands up against us, dear Lord. We ask all this in your precious name, in the intercession of St. Mary, all your angels and all your saints who have pleased you ever since the beginning. Hear us when we say with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Are we good to go? Okay. We'll just record audio or, or phone. All right, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We're almost done with the series on the spiritual armor of God. I have learned so much about this concept, and I hope you have too. But to have heard it, to have discussed it, to have read it, and to have studied it are actually not enough. It would be very sad for there to be real spiritual casualties in our church now because we didn't put on the armor of God. Not because the battle was fierce, but because we didn't even put on the armor of God. If the things that we discuss at church never get applied, then there's almost no point. I heard the story of this small country in the, in the uh, Caribbean, I think it was the Dominican Republic, where there's a statistic about 25 to 30 casualties a day. Why? Well there, it's very convenient for them to use little motorbikes. And so they use these motorbikes, they're cheap, they're fast, you can get in and out, but there's 25 to 30 deaths a day. Why? Is it because there is a lack of helmets? Is it because they're not putting them on? Could you imagine that God has given us this armor, these opportunities to defend ourselves, to wage a good war, to fight a good fight, and we're not applying them? We've been doing this series for almost six weeks. Have you made an effort to fight a good fight? So we've talked about it. I'm going to go through it a little bit quickly. We've girded our loins with truth. We've put on the blessed breastplate of righteousness. We've shod our feet with the gospel of peace. Last week we talked about taking up the breast, sorry, the faith of, sorry, the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. 
Every week we do this, I wonder what is the most important piece? I mean, the first week we learned that the belt of truth, it kind of holds the other pieces of armor together. Then I thought the breastplate of righteousness was cool because it protects your heart and I feel like we should have our heart. And then last week he said, but above all, take the shield of faith. And as great as it is to protect your feet and your heart and your core, it actually stinks to have your head cut off. It's actually not good. And so the helmet, which was made of leather and covered in metal, it protected against the sword. Now there is different kinds of swords. There's the sharp sword and the broad sword. It was about three to four feet long. It required two hands to hold it. And when you swung it, it took all your strength, but oh, how it could crush a skull or take off your head. Protecting your head is actually fairly important. Ask Goliath. I mean, he was almost completely protected, even in his head, except for, for just one small area. That even one small area of access to his head, and this giant was struck down. So what does this piece of armor represent spiritually? The purpose of it is to protect the mind. We've talked about this, what a critical war tactic. If Satan could have access to your mind, then maybe he could lead the whole person. It makes sense that our minds are guarding our actions. Now, if they're not, I would like to discuss this with you because our minds should be leading our actions. This war is very significant. And so St. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We've got strongholds and we've got arguments and things that are exalting themselves against the knowledge of God. It's amazing how a thought or an idea planted in your head can be quite a powerful weapon. And this is what Satan is trying to do. This was St. Paul in his effort in the ministry and he says, but even if our gospel is veiled, is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Satan is trying to blind our minds, to confuse us. He's trying to separate our minds and our thoughts from the wisdom of God, the thoughts of God, and the acts of God. In our discussion last week, in our small group, we were talking about faith. And we were saying how we have all experiences of acts of faith where God delivers, where God got us through this thing and this thing, and He took us through an illness and through a problem at work and through a relationship, and He was there, and then we get to some stage where we forget what God has done. We could all clearly see that God has done things for us, yet when it came down to it, our minds were clouded. We had forgotten what God had done. Now, Satan's greatest desire is to cloud your mind about one thing in particular. It's probably the most important thing. It's our salvation. One of the greatest defenses, and I want you to remember this, one of the greatest defenses you have against the plots of Satan is to hold on to your salvation. And when I talk about salvation, it's not just the heaven, but it's all that God has done to obtain it and everything that relates to salvation. Without remembrance of salvation, what is the result? For those who don't believe in a resurrection, and Father David mentioned some of this, but those without that hope are the most pitiful of all people. They have no hope. They live a life of feeling trapped. So many of them, their thoughts are imprisoning them. Maybe because of experiences they've had, whether it be in their home with their parents or with their spouse, or even at work, they've been led to think 
that they are of very little value, value, that they are unlovable, that they are failures, as Father David mentioned today, that they aren't useful. Maybe because of certain sins that we've fallen into over and over for so many years, they feel such a great sense of shame and guilt. They feel evil, as though someone as evil as them could never go to heaven. And so they lose faith in the God who saved them. Last week I mentioned that I was going to a conference this week and I actually made it there. It was a conference put together by some Christian organizations on how to deal with pornography in the church. Uh, it's an incredible topic and eventually we'll get to that. But I got to hear the testimony of men and women that were such victims of this disease. They were so trapped. Their minds were so consumed. For years and years, they could not escape. They were under the control of what people are calling the new drug. They definitely felt powerless. They definitely felt hopeless. And what they wanted was freedom. They just wanted freedom. Isn't that what Christ came to give us? And Galatians 5.1 says this, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty which Christ has made us free. Christ has made us free. Through what? Through His salvation. Don't be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Satan wants to enslave us to make us feel as though we're under his power. What was amazing at the conference was that there were so many stories of victory and so many stories of recovery, not because of their own abilities, but because their understanding of the reality of the truth of Christ's salvation given to all of us. Sinners. Even the worst of sinners. Under that control, they felt like the worst people. And then St. Paul reminds us that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. Worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I am the first among them. This has to be one of the most hopeful sayings that you could ever encounter in the Bible. For you to know, for you to say it constantly, Christ Jesus came to save the worst of sinners. He came to save the worst of sinners, even me. Don't you ever lose hope of that. How is it that if we remember what Christ has done for us, someone could think that they are unlovable, they are of no value, that they are failures? We all know the famous verse, for God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes should have eternal life. What was the motivation? He so loved you. Another great verse, it said God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died. Much more than having now been justified, one of the benefits of Christ's cross was that we were justified, we were, our sins were removed, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. If when we were enemies we were reconciled to God, He reconciled us in His death, then through how much more having been reconciled will we be saved by His life. So he's talking about justification, he's talking about saving, being saved from wrath, reconciliation, being saved by his life, and then he says, but not only that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Such hope, such positive things, not that he says that you will achieve when you die. He says these are things that have happened and are happening now. I know this is very Bible verse intensive, which is okay. It's a good place to do it. 
Listen to these verses about salvation. He said in St. Peter's first epistle, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. He's begotten us again. We are born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that's incorruptible. Part of the salvation we're getting. And undefiled. And this inheritance does not fade away. Look at this. It's reserved in heaven for you. There's already a place for you there. You are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. You see, God already did an amazing work. He's got plans for you, not here on earth only. He's got reservations in your name that no one can take away. Granted, you could let it go. You could leave it. So he says, it's kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. I'm going to mention salvation just for a brief moment. You know, salvation is mentioned in terms of our eternal redemption in two ways. There is an objective salvation. It's the truth that Christ died for all mankind as a whole. So someone could say, was Hitler saved? Christ died for all mankind. He was saved. But the second part is our personal part. And the New Testament talks about righteousness, holiness, and salvation. It's realized as a continuance of the objective of salvation. When our energy is in communion with God's divine energy and grace. There has to be this personal reception and this personal assimilation of the gift of God into our lives. And so we believe we are saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. But we're also taught to work out our salvation. The objective part where Christ died on the cross, you didn't have anything to do with it. Christ did it, we're all saved. But the next part, the personal part where you're working out your salvation, through faith we will be saved. And through participating with Christ and His grace and walking with Him daily through a life in the church of repentance and becoming more and more like Him. Do we all understand this? The salvation process was begun 2,000 years ago. It's undeniable. So many people testified about it. It's the foundation for all that we believe, the death on the cross and the resurrection together. And along with the incarnation, the ascension, and the Pentecost. That's all part, and it's already happened. But... Salvation isn't something that happened or that will happen. We're actually being saved every day. And I don't want you to think that God's benefits won't happen to you now. I want everyone to realize that this continuous union, we're being saved daily from the power of sin. Every day in this war, that Satan is trying to fight against us, we are being saved daily. God is giving us power. He's giving us the ability to conquer. Not we will be conquerors. It says we are conquerors through the salvation that we have received through what Christ already did. And then if we continue till our last breath, we will be glorified on that final day. Salvation is not an impossibility anymore. It was. But it's not an impossibility for you. And I want to even tell you, it's not even an improbability. It's more than probable. You are going to be saved. We say in the liturgy, guide us into your kingdom. Like that's where we're headed. That's where we're going. That's where we're destined. The heavenly Jerusalem, we're already on the way. But Satan wants you to think, oh, you're not good enough. And to make you think you're not good enough is also to make you to believe that Christ's sacrifice and salvation wasn't good enough. Not even for the chief of sinners. After all that's been offered, you're already on the right track. Just keep going. Don't stop and don't let go. Because I want you to realize this is Satan's last 
chance. Once you're on the other side, he can't touch you. And so his goal is now, while he has a chance to mess with your mind. So, I want you to realize this, and I love this verse. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Not He will. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He has conveyed us, already transferred us from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. Do you believe that you are there? You should. You can experience the kingdom of God now. When you come to the liturgy, what happens here is the kingdom of God with all of heaven participating, us being united, the heavenly and the earthly in Him. So, I hope you're assured that you're on the right track. God has already done His part and you have to just continue what you're doing. What are we supposed to do now? I want you to have confidence in God as a Savior. As a Deliverer. I don't know what situation you are in right now. You might be in a very difficult situation in your marriage. You might have a relationship with a parent, a sibling, a friend. It needs deliverance. There is a financial situation. There's a legal situation. There's, there's just a self-reflection situation where you just say, who's going to help me? From that sin that just has not gone away, even like the man who was paralyzed for 38 years. I want you to realize Christ is a savior at every moment, in every battle, and in any battle. No matter where you are, you can always call on Christ's name at that moment. You don't have to wait. You can always call on Him. My confession father used to always teach me, pray Psalm 69. Oh God, my Savior, do not delay. Come now. Don't delay. Save me now. I want you to never forget Christ is your Savior. That's part of the helmet of salvation. Salvation has a Savior, but then what else do we have to do? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. This is the next part. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. One of the things that they talked about at this conference was the neurobiology of these addictions and how these negative thoughts kept coming and coming and how it affected the mind was affecting the brain where certain parts of the brain were shrinking. But that through different types of thoughts, the brain could then recover. By changing the patterns and the types of thoughts that you were constantly thinking, you could change the size or the capability of your brain. Your brain can actually be retrained. At the Ages of 4 to 12, the brain is growing so fast, it's called plasticity, where it's growing and molding and learning new skills. But you know what? Your brain doesn't stop. It can still be transformed. If you were to stop allowing the negative thoughts, well, let me, let me tell you our, our strategy here. Actually, this is going to be our strategy. To recognize, to reject and rebuke, and to replace with Holy Scriptures. To recognize. Can you tell when Satan has put 
a lie in your mind? Can you tell when the thoughts are not godly thoughts? Can you tell when you are trying to be deceived? This was our first talk when we talked about the belt of truth. Satan is a liar and the father of liars and his main point is deception. For you to think God is disgusted with you. To think that your sins do not allow you to be worthy of God's love, His kindness, His grace. That you haven't earned enough to go to heaven. You haven't been good enough for you to go to heaven. You're not doing your part. You need to recognize those are not God's ways. Those are not God's thoughts. You find me a place in the Bible where God tells you to give up hope. You tell me a place in the Bible where it says God's mercy is very limited and His grace is, is something that He gives very stingily. I don't even know if that's a word, but I believe He gives it very givingly. Maybe, if that's a word. Can you recognize the negative thoughts and the lies in your life that are keeping you from living the potential of following the purpose of Christ. Then, reject and rebuke. Who is the gatekeeper of your mind? It's you. It's you. I'm sure you've heard this famous saying, you can't prevent a bird from landing on your head, but you can prevent it from building a nest. You're the one that allows the thought to come. You're the one, sorry, you don't allow it to come, but you are the one that allows it to stay or to leave. It's amazing when you are tempted with something. I would imagine you guys have all used a computer, probably use it frequently. You all have phones that have images. It's amazing, you know, you can read an article about basketball, and at the bottom of the article, there's all kinds of pictures of like, if you click on it, it'll take you to someplace negative. You can even read like a blog of a Christian, and because the blog host site is by some secular website, there's all these things around it that are temptations. The thought will come in, I could click. But as soon as you reject it, as soon as you rebuke it, as soon as you say that's not from God, you go to another website, it's gone. It's gone. I don't know if we have this practice, and are we practicing the idea of bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ? I will tell you, based on my very little experience, I think there's nothing that casts out a thought more efficiently and more quickly than this prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. The Jesus prayer. Man. I started to read a book called uh, The Way of a Pilgrim when I was a senior in high school. I mean, it's all about this prayer and how this guy found this prayer. And I was at a most basic level tried to practice it. So I'm not saying I was this person who lived in the desert for 30 years. For those of my friends who remember me at that time when I was, I was the crazy one in the group that always would just be like saying things on the side and you know, like, I wasn't very popular back then. I was trying to practice this. At that time, 17, 18, you can imagine how a male could easily be tempted by thoughts. It was the greatest refuge I had ever found. My Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. My Lord Jesus Christ, help me. My Lord Jesus Christ, purify me. My Lord Jesus Christ, protect me. I mean, Lord Jesus Christ, guide me. Whatever it is, the power of the name, you have the authority and the ability and a weapon to reject and rebuke. My Lord Jesus Christ, who loves me. My Lord Jesus Christ, who saved me. When you're having those thoughts of negativity, my Lord Jesus Christ, who is in me, who has given me value, can you reject things with the Lord Jesus Christ, He's given you the authority and His desire and His will. Practice it. Then the last thing is replace it with Holy Scriptures. It's one thing to try to always protect and cast out. It's very easy to fill a place that's empty than to try and empty a place that's already full. 
Satan wants to fill your mind with things if you're not thinking. But, but what if your mind is always full of something godlike, of something holy? How many of us are using the Bible on a daily basis where if you have a devotional or if you read a Bible, how many of you are using a verse a week or a verse a day? Where every day God has given you something to meditate on, to chew on, and all day Satan is trying to fight that one verse. I was reading a story about a lady who, she has a note card in her car, she changes it every week. It's a Bible verse that she's thinking about the whole week. So that her mind is occupied, but that she has a memory, an experience of what that verse is. She's looking for it throughout the whole week. I want you to recognize the lies. I want you to reject the temptations. But if you fill your mind with good things from the Bible, it's so hard for Satan to try and remove those from you. Salvation is the greatest news this world has ever heard. And I want you to know it's not far away. It's in your hands. What a privilege we have in being saved. So we're reading the book of Ephesians. Chapter 6 is where all this stuff is, right? The spiritual armor of God. St. Paul, when he mentions things in the armor... He's already discussed it quite well in the rest of the epistle. So he says the helmet of salvation. I'm going to read to you a little bit of Ephesians chapter 1. Some of the benefits of having been saved by God. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, just words. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. He chose us in Him that we would be holy, that we would be without blame. We're adopted as sons, that we will experience the riches of His grace, the forgiveness of sins, that we would be to the good pleasure of His will, that we will have obtained a rich and glorious inheritance, that there would be exceeding greatness of His power, that we would be sealed by the Holy Spirit. These are few not even all of the things in chapter 1 regarding those who are saved. Behold, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Your mind can become renewed. I know... A man, I got to stay with his family for a little while, about 10, 12 years back. Sweetest man. He's, he's elderly. He has sons. He has three sons. He was so kind with his wife. His wife could talk your ears off. Oh, man. And he was so kind. And so, Habibti, yes, Habibti, no, Habibti. Like every, I was like, where did you get this from? You want to know what startled me? I only got to know two of his sons. I never got to know his third son. His third son had left a long time ago. You want to know why his son left the house? Because of the anger he used to always experience in his father. When someone told me that the third son left because the dad was angry, the same dad who I found to be the most kind and loving person, I said, how did that happen? How was his mind rerouted? It was rerouted, and it was through his stronger relationship and involvement with Christ. I read a story about a successful businessman living for himself, tons of money. And then it happened, he came to Christ, and guess what happened? At the time of Hurricane Katrina, this big mega church decided they needed to have people that can go and serve there. They were going to send tons of volunteers, but they needed someone that could manage. So here's this guy who lived a life of self-centeredness and gain and growth. And then when it came time for Hurricane Katrina, he said, you know what? I think that calling is for me. At the pinnacle of his success, he decides to go and live in a flooded area where there's hardly any good visibly 
and he says, I'm going to get rid of everything. And instead of being self-centered, I am going to go, I'm going to manage the volunteers for the people that are hurting most. The angry man became a lamb. The selfish man became selfless. The addicted to pornography became freed. The unforgiving became forgiving. Those without hope have received hope. Our minds need to be refitted and sanctified. Are you willing to go to war for your minds? I want you to realize you have the helmet of salvation. Don't ever be discouraged. Don't ever take it off. You have been touched by the Holy Spirit. What a beautiful thing that is. Go and be strong. Go and be courageous. Go and be hopeful. Go and be rejoiceful. Go get that inheritance which has been reserved for you. Your name is there. Continue the walk. We will be victorious. Let's stand and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. My dear Lord, God and Savior, my Deliverer, Jesus Christ, it wasn't because I or us were of no value. It was because you created us, you formed us, you gave us potential, you desired us to be with you, you did everything you could so that we would be there, you've handed it to us, you've done everything, there is nothing more that you could do. All you've asked is for us to hold on to it, not to doubt it, not to let it go, not to ignore it, not to neglect it. What would happen if we neglected so great a salvation? Dear Lord, we are your children. We've been transferred into your kingdom. And why do we feel as though we've been kicked out? I pray, dear Lord, that you would cast those thoughts away from every one of us. I pray, dear Lord, that you would give us faith. But give us hope and give us joy. Allow us to rejoice in this great work which you have done. And you are not only done, but that you are continuing to do. That you are a deliverer and a savior that is at my beckoning call. I thank you, dear Lord, because you are so near, that there is nothing that you cannot defeat, that there is no way that we could not be conquerors if we held on to you. You said that we would be more than conquerors. We claim this today. We claim your promise. We are victorious, dear Lord, in you, and we will continue to fight this fight. We know that you have given us all authority to trample on the serpents and scorpions and every single power of the enemy. We praise you and glorify you and we rejoice in having been reconciled and forgiven and cleansed. If only we could see and feel and taste the greatness that you've given us now. Help us, O oh Lord, to taste. Help us, Lord, to see. Help us, O oh Lord, to apply and to never lose hope. I pray for not only those of us here right now that are standing, but every one of us who's struggling with a sin, who's struggling with a negative thought. I pray, dear Lord, in the power of your name, in the power of the name of Jesus Christ, help us, O Lord, to be able to bring every negative, condemning thought into captivity and place it at the foot of your cross in the light of your resurrection, knowing that those are lies. Our mind is yours. And by the Spirit within us, as the Spirit knows your mind, let the Spirit give us, help us to put on the mind of Christ. You are our helmet. You personally are our salvation. And we praise you and glorify you and thank you. And ask that you continue to lead us throughout this way into your kingdom by the blood of your cross, by the blood you shed on the cross for us through the power of your resurrection. We ask all this in the intercession of St. Mary, Archangel Michael, all the martyrs, all the victorious saints. Hear us when we, your children, cry unto you with one voice, saying, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one through Christ Jesus our Lord, for then is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.